from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm Catalina Gomez, the Vice President of the Hispanic Cultural Society here at the Library of Congress. We're delighted to have Maria Rana today to present uh, La Raza Cosmica, the Cosmic Rays, who are Hispanics anyway, our opening event for Hispanic Heritage Month, so we're really excited. Um, Georgette Dorn, the Chief of the Hispanic Division, will be presenting Marie uh, in just a moment. But before we begin, we, I would like to uh, first give thanks to our sister organizations who are co-sponsoring this event with us, uh, Asian, um, Asian American Association, the Daniel A. P. Murray Association, and Library of Congress Blacks and Governments um, Organization here in the library. So with, you, with this, I'll leave you with Georgia Dorn, Chief of the Hispanic Division. Thank you. Thank you, Catalina, especially because you worked so hard to make this event so wonderful. Uh, I want to thank the Hispanic Heritage Committee of the Library of Congress and the Hispanic Culture Society for organizing eight outstanding events to celebrate Hispanic culture. Special thanks go to Francisco Macias, Catalina Gomez, Le Leah Kirvin, Marlene Torres, Roberto Salazar, and Rosa Hernandez, and all the others. It is indeed a pleasure to introduce Maria Rana. She was born of a Peruvian father and an American mother in Peru. She came to the U.S. at an early age and received a bachelor's degree in Russian from Northwestern University, a master's from the University of Hong Kong, and a certificate from Yale. She worked at various publishing houses and was senior editor at Simon and, Simon and Schuster. For many years, Marie was the editor of the Washington Post Book World, which we still miss. As editor of Book World, she joined with the White House, Dr. Billington, and the Library of Congress to establish the first book festival, which was held in 2011, just a weekend before the infamous 9-11. Marie's first book, American Chica, Two Worlds, One Childhood, about her early experiences, was a finalist for the National Book Award in 2001. And several other premios follow. Subsequent books by her include The Writing Life, Cellophane, Lima Nights, Through the Eyes of the Condor, The Letter for the National Geographic. And this year, she published the acclaimed biography of Simon Bolivar. Marie, Marie was named a distinguished fellow at the Kluge Center and is now a member of the Scholars Council of the Center. Since last year, she has been serving as special assistant to Dr. Billington. She is currently organizing with several divisions of the library a celebration of Mexico, which will be held on December 12 and, 11, and 13, and which will feature lectures, poetry, music, film, footage from Mexican Revolution, and I hope you will all come. Es un placer presentarles a María Rana. Thank you so much, Georgette, and thank you oops, all for coming. Such a pleasure to be here. Um, I owe so much to the library. Uh, this is a place where, where I came first as a, as a reader, as a student, as a uh, budding scholar. Uh, and then came here as a researcher to do my books, uh, all of them, really, uh, especially Simon Bolivar, which I spent almost the entire time writing here in, in the Library of Congress, given a wonderful space at the Kluge Center. So I am I'm so grateful to the Library of Congress in a million ways. And now, of course, to be, to be um, working in the librarian's office as a consultant on, on Latin American affairs is such a pleasure. So it's, thank you so much for inviting me to be here and to the um, Hispanic Cultural Society of the Library of Congress, which I've just joined. So <laughs> um, I want this to be a little bit like a testimonio, what we call a testimonio in Peru, uh, and in fact throughout South America, where you stand up before your village and you say your piece. You say what, um, what you've been through, what you've experienced, and, and what you want to tell your people. And since you're all my people, library people, book people, um, people of the book, um, I'm going to 
do a testimonio and just tell you a little bit about my own experience and my own life and my sort of coming to terms uh, with identity, with Hispanic identity. Uh, I remember uh, actually as a child uh, coming to the States at the age of about 10 years old and we landed in Miami uh, and we took a bus up to um, to New Jersey, which is where I went to school and, and grew up until I went off to college. And uh, I remember at the time moving into this little uh, town in New Jersey and being really having my sister and my brother being the only Hispanic faces that I saw in school. Of course, you now in New Jersey is completely uh, Hispanic in so many ways. And I go back to the same little town and it's, uh, it is uh, Spanish speaking, it is very Hispanic. There are somebody, there are quite a few Aranas in the school where I went to school. Uh, so it is a very different place. But at the time when I arrived, my whole purpose was really to become an American, as you know, the American way. You become an American, you put your head down, you, you do what everybody else does, you try to, to talk the way that everybody else does and, and, uh, and uh, look like everybody else if you can, and so you, you, know, you go about that business. And I went about that business, I think, rather earnestly, and I never really thought about my identity. I mean, I was going in and out of a Spanish-speaking household, but I never really thought about what that meant until pretty late in life. I had already uh, had a job at uh, Simon & Schuster as a publisher. I had gone through um, uh, my studies, Russian, Chinese, come to, the, to New York, taken a job in, uh, in publishing, and you know, published basically US political books, US history, uh, European history, biographies, everything. Um, some things in translation because I could do it, but it was, I wasn't really thinking about it in terms of identity. And then I came to Washington and I was offered the job of, um, at the time, deputy uh, books editor for the Washington Post. Eventually it became the editor in chief. But the first time anybody really asked me about my identity as a Hispanic person, as someone who had been born um, in a Spanish speaking household, born abroad, was at the Washington Post, and it was the first day that I arrived at work. And I remember because I was in the human resources office signing my little piece of paper to, to come in, and they were taking my data down. Uh, this was back in uh, 92, when you didn't file everything digitally. And they asked me, the head of human resources asked me uh, where I was born, and I said, Lima, Lima Peru. And, and she turned around, she looked up, and she said, you were born in Lima, Peru? And I said, yes. And she said, well, that, does that mean I can put you down as a minority hire? And I said, by all means. It was the first time also um, that anybody had paid attention to my Hispanicity, really. Uh, in, at Simon & Schuster, nobody had asked. At Harcourt Brace, nobody had asked. At the University of Hong Kong, nobody had asked. But the Washington Post, for some reason, was, uh, they said, well, can, can, we know we've hired you into the book section, but can we, ha can we send you out to do stories about um, Hispanics in the area and about you know, stories from South America? Whenever you go, can we do that? And I said, absolutely. And I began, at that point, writing about Hispanics and about being Hispanic. And it was at that point that I started thinking about that little girl who came at the age of 10, rode that bus from Miami and came up to New Jersey, and um, who that child was and what she was made of and you know what that whole background of ancestry meant to me at the time. And it was what prompted me to write American Chica, which was my memoir of two worlds. And uh, it, was, it was really rather um, extraordinary because going back to that time, being that 10-year-old landing in this country, it was in the early 60s. And we were coming up in a bus to New Jersey. And I remember very well stopping in the bus stations along the way and having there be signs that said whites only. And I had to say to my father, what, am, what, what does that mean? And he said, well, it means whites only. It means that you know, if you're white, you go there. If you're not, you don't. 
And I said, well, what are we? What am I? And I honestly, it, it was a confused moment for me. And beyond that, when we actually arrived in, in New Jersey, and I understood that, you know, there were, there was a, a, a white culture, there was a black culture, but there was no, his, no Hispanic culture, at least in that little pocket of New Jersey where we were. And um, so going back to think about that little girl and about that, uh, that notion of trying to figure out who I was um, was a very, sort of, a very important uh, step for me. I had always been curious about um, race from childhood. And I remember looking, uh, and this is very important because going back to think about that child writing American Chica, going back and thinking about looking, uh, sitting in my grandparents' house in Lima, Peru, and going through family albums and seeing that there were people of different color in our family. And I would say, well, who's that? And it was somebody who looked quite African. And they said, oh, that's your aunt's, uh, you know, uh, great aunt so-and-so. And I would say, oh. And I said, well, you know, uh, oh, they, they would say, not only is it your great aunt Matilda, but we used to call her Negrita. And so I said, oh, that's interesting. And I said, who's that over there? And they would say, oh, that's, uh, you know, that's your aunt um, China. She looked Chinese. That's your Aunt China. Um, and then you ask the, the obvious question, are we Chinese? Are we African? It was, oh, no, 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 we're Criollos, we're Peruvians, we're no, 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 no. And it was an, an amazing feeling, I think, as a child, knowing or sensing. I mean, you could see it in the family photographs. You could see it in the people who came to, to Sunday um, lonche. You, you could see a family that was, you know, filled with every race uh, imaginable. And it was always, no, 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 somos criollos, no somos peruanos, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, we're not anything but Peruvian, you know, and we're, we uh, had been a family that had been in, in Peru for uh, almost 500 years. Uh, first, Arana arrived there in 1570. Um, so, you know, it was uh, obviously a Peruvian identity, whatever it was. In the process of writing American Chica, I went out and got my DNA done. I remember my parents' reaction because they were, you know, you're getting your DNA done? I mean, that's what, you do, what the criminals do. Or, you know, people who have paternity issues do. But not just, you know, normal people don't do that. I said, no, I'm going to go do that. So I went and did that, and sure enough, it came back, and I was so excited because it confirmed everything I had felt since that uh, childhood of mine, um, asking all of those questions and having them answered so unsatisfactorily. I came, my DNA came back, black African, indigenous, East Asian, Indo-European all the races of man. I went back and did the Indo-European part because I thought, Indo-European, okay, what's that? That means anywhere from, you know, Finland, Denmark, all the way down to Pakistan. So it doesn't tell you much. So I went back and said, okay, I want to do, and had another swab and did the Indo-European, and it was everything. It was uh, everything from Northern European all the way down to um, Indian, Pakistani, Semitic, both sides, Arab, Jewish. So there again, a complete kind of hitting all the, tick, all, ticking all the boxes. And um, it was extraordinary to me because, you know, when you say you are a Hispanic, you only say that in the United States of America. You don't say that in Peru. You don't say that in Mexico. You don't say you're a Hispanic in Ecuador. 
you come to the United States and you say you are a Hispanic here. And it's very strange because then, you know, as of when was it, 1970 was the first time that they started asking you if you were Hispanic in the census. And you're meant to, to hit a box. And it's so unrepresentative of who we are. Because, you know, we, we are um, so many races in one. And it has always struck me uh, that uh, it was bizarre to be ticking off the boxes. We don't, we don't, we're not Hispanic until we are in the United States of America and we are identified as such. And what is so remarkable to me is that we accept that uh, label. We take it on. And in fact, it is uh, an extraordinary uniting uh, label because you, 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 okay, you all speak Spanish. You may or may not be uh, Catholic, but it's likely that you are. Um, there are uniting uh, aspects to being uh, Hispanic, but having been in this hemisphere for some of us for as many as 500 years, we are totally mixed race people. Uh, this prompted me, of course, to start looking around uh, and all of my books have actually been about race. And they have been in some one way or another about being Hispanic, about being uh, identifying with uh, different races as we do. This, of course, depends very much on when you've come to Latin America. There are those of us in Latin America who have come in, in the last generation, last two generations. <laughs> And then the race is, it may or may not be uh, the kind of mixed race that I'm talking about. But by the time that um, 200 years ago, when Simon Bolivar was writing about race, and race was very important to him, and I'll tell you why a, a bit more about that in a minute. But Bolivar was uh, very, very clear about the fact that uh, Latin Americans were a very different quantity. Um, he said, our people, this is a quote, our people are nothing like Europeans or North Americans. Indeed, we are more a mixture of Africa and America. By America, he meant indigenous people. And indigenous people are really, uh, actually scientifically considered Asians. Then we are children of Europe. We all differ visibly in the color of our skin. It's impossible to say, said Simon Bolivar, with any certainty to which human race we belong, which is the kind of straightforward acknowledgement of race that um, no leading figure in the United States of America in his time was saying. I mean, this was in the uh, early 1800s, really an extraordinary uh, statement for Bolivar. And then, uh, many years later, uh, 1880, was born uh, Juan Vasconce uh, Jose Vasconcelos, excuse me, of Mexico, who, very, very interesting figure. Uh, Vasconcelos was um, the Minister of Culture. He set up public education in the rural areas. He was, uh, he was very much uh, an indigenous. He, uh, was a promoter of uh, the, these great, fabulous murals in Mexico that we now know by Diego Rivera and Siqueiros, which he had put in public places. Vasconcelos was a philosopher, very interesting man. He ended up actually quite a controversial figure because he was so anti-American, North American, that he eventually sided with uh, or was very sympathetic to Hitler, which was not a good idea at the time. But what, 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 what uh, Vasconcelos said at the time, which was very interesting concept, which is, is what I'm trying to say, is um, that in fact Latin Americans are a cosmic race. Cosmic because um, of the blending for so many years. Uh, cosmic also in a future sense because he believed that the experiment 
that was being conducted in Latin America of mixing races, of, uh, uh, of actually making a broad, vast uh, race of, of mixed um, backgrounds was an important venture. And he said, um, the leaders of American independence, by that he meant the Latin American independence and uh, Simon Bolivar San Martin, strove to free the slaves, declared the equality of all men by natural law, the social and civic equality of whites, blacks, and Indians. In an instant of historical crisis, they formulated the transcendental mission assigned to our region of the globe, the, mi the mission of fusing people ethnically and spiritually. This struck me as um, really important. And in the process of trying to explain, as I've tried to do in my books, uh, in memoir and in fiction and now in biography, um, who Latin Americans are, is a very important aspect, I think. I had a, a really strange and inspiring, actually, experience once in London when I was doing a, um, a literary event uh, for the Peruvian Anglo Society. And we had invited a, a Peruvian intellectual, I don't want to say his name because I'm about to badmouth him in a, in a, in a way. He's a wonderful intellectual figure, wonderful poet who came to do a reading in, in London. And there was a great big reception that was given for him by the, uh, the Peruvian ambassador to London at the time. And uh, the Peruvian ambassador had everybody gathered there. And he was just sort of talking off the top of his head. And he said, you know, one thing I don't really think the people realize is how in, in Latin America, which I don't see it much in textbooks, is how it is that the darker races, the blacks and the, uh, the Indians, actually won our independence in Latin America. And the poet took him aside. And I was right there because I was part of the program. And he, he took the ambassador aside and um, said, Mr. Ambassador, I feel I have to tell you, this is really an embarrassment. How could you say such a thing? How could you say such a falsity? I've never heard of the fact that the, the blacks and the Indians liberated us. It was the white aristocrats who, who started the revolutions in Latin America. And that was, you know, that was who accomplished the, the revolutions. What are you talking about? And you should really, really check your history before you speak publicly like that. And it actually took, took my breath away because he was here was somebody who was, you know, a very educated man. He didn't know the history himself. And I went running off at that point to bring a couple of historians, a Peruvian historian and a Mexican historian, to come and, and, and say to this quite illustrious poet that, in fact, this was the case. Uh, it was the case that uh, San Martin's forces, Bolivar's forces, they actually um, were able to achieve the uh, victories of the wars of independence because they, their armies, they had, they had staffed their armies with blacks and indigenous. And, and those were the forces that actually rose and rose and battalions after battalions actually uh, won independence for Latin America. So it was there that I, I uh, really began to think about um, that aspect of history, too, and how, how independence came and what that meant for the races at the time. Uh, the story of Simon Bolivar, uh, which uh, the book that I've just published, it is, it's a story that is a canvas, a very dramatic narrative that is filled with, with romance and adventure and disaster. It's an extraordinary story. But the, uh, the, the relevant part of the story for me, at least for, for this discussion that we're having here, um, is the way that Bolivar, uh, not until the third time that he attempted a revolution, he was cast out, he was exiled twice. And the third time, uh, he was, the second time he was exiled to Haiti. 
and uh, he was in Haiti when uh, he was trying to gather the will and the forces and the, all the help that he could to um, go back and liberate his country or his, his peace people, the Venezuelan people. And uh, uh, he had received no help from the United States of America at that point. The United States of America's largest gross national product in that time, 1816, uh, was slavery. It was through slavery that the cotton could get uh, uh, collected and sold, that everything, all the whole engine, there's a wonderful book by Gordon Wood um, called Empire of Liberty, and I urge you to look at it because it shows you very clearly that the uh, s slavery was big business in the United States. So the last thing that the United States wanted to do was to help Latin American independence if Latin America was going to use slaves to win that independence. And the terror that they had of the events that had happened in Haiti were uh, the fuel for this fear of helping Latin Americans. So it was absolutely verboten and, and uh, illegal to sell arms to Latin Americans to, um, to help in any way, to send soldiers down in any way to help the revolution that was afoot, even though you would think that a country that had just won its independence itself would help the other countries in the hemisphere. But this was, this was something that was not even, not, not tolerated, not spoken about. Uh, so he had no help from the United States. He had no help from England, because England at that point then was beginning to um, uh, side with Spain. Uh, against Napoleon. So there was uh, that problem. He couldn't get any help from England. He couldn't help get any help from France either, obviously, because France thought that they were going to own Latin America when they invaded uh, Spain and took over, it, it, it assumed, in fact, sent expeditionary forces to take over the colonies in Latin America. Um, so he had help from nobody, but he ends up in Haiti in his second exile and uh, speaking with Alexander Pétion, who was the president of Haiti at the time, and Pétion says to him, I'll help you. I will introduce you to people who own ships, uh, commercial enterprises that can do contraband uh, munitions, arms sales to you, and I will help you, but you have to make me one promise. And Bolivar said, what is that? And he said, the moment that you set foot, on uh, Latin America to conduct your wars of independence again, you must free the slaves. And Bolivar had already been thinking that that was the only way that he would be able to accomplish this because uh, he could see that the attempts, the two attempts that had been made so far had been foiled by the fact that it was so divisive racially so when he actually went back that third time, he consolidated uh, the races. And, it, and, and first thing he did, he the, was good on his promise to Pétion. He freed the slaves and uh, then pr proceeded to do the very hard task of actually uh, trying to unite the forces behind the concept of revolution, behind the concept of independence, actually behind the concept at the time uh, for something that he wanted very much, which was a united Latin America, one nation, Latin America as a bulwark against the growing power of North America and against the um, sort of monarchic, constant monarchic threats of Europe. Uh, unfortunately, his uh, vision never came to pass in Latin America. There were so many, he actually died a very tragic uh, death. He was uh, very sick, uh, uh, completely disowned, reviled by every country he had liberated. He had, uh, by, uh, by the time he died, Latin America, the Latin America that he had trod was in, uh, in the process of becoming six independent republics. He had, he had traveled 75,000 miles on horseback which is like going from uh, the tip of Alaska to the tip of Argentina, from, from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, 
and back again five times in order to, to do it. Um, and his dream of a unified Latin America was completely lost, completely dashed. Uh, every, uh, there were uh, pockets of, of um, generals who wanted to have their own little territorial uh, uh, areas. And, and, and in fact, um, the uh, hemisphere, well actually uh, the Americas at that point, was spinning in considerable chaos at the time, uh, all of it, all the way down to Argentina. And um, so I often say that, in fact, Bolivar's dream, which was that all Hispanics should consider themselves one, um, was actually achieved in this country, in what I just mentioned earlier, which is a kind of Hispanicity that we all feel when we get into uh, the United States of America, which makes us check that one box. Um, and in fact, though we may, we may be many races, though we may be uh, many colors, in fact, you know, the whole you know, panoply of DNA um, is potentially in us, that we are, that we do consider ourselves one, which is something that Simon Bolivar always wanted to happen. Um, as I've always said, in order to understand who we are and what we represent, uh, we need to look to history to explain it to us. Um, there was, and I'll end with this um, before I take your questions, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, there was, some years ago, maybe it was as many as 15 years ago, a Time magazine cover that said, here is the face of a morphed race person. Do you remember that at all? It was a, a morphed, uh, it was a, a, they had morphed all the races and come up with this face. And I remember because my, um, my daughter came running through the house, said, Mama, te parece, looks like you. And in fact, uh, there was a woman who looked a little bit like me. Um, you know, you morph all the races and what do you get? A Latin American. Um, as Michael Jackson said, we're the world. As Walt Whitman said, perhaps um, more resonantly, we contain multitudes. Thank you very much for li listening. I'd love to have your questions. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Where did the term Hispanic come from? Um, well, it comes from, you know, from, from being a Spanish background, which is kind of a ridiculous term, uh, because there are many so-called Hispanics who are 100% non-Hispanic, you know, <laughs> indigenous or, or, or black. It's a, it's a false label uh, that we accept. Um, the other, you know, there's, there's a, there actually is, is a, a bit of a, of a debate over whether uh, we should use Hispanic or Latino. Uh, depends on the region. It depends on, who, you know, if you're in, in, in Cuba, you, in a Cuban Miami, you feel one way. If you're in, in uh, uh, Mexican, Chicano, uh, Me uh, Texas, you feel another way. It's got sort of an interesting, just, just a label. Questions? Yes. Oh, um, thank you for the great presentation. Thank you. It's always wonderful to hear you. Um, thank you. And so many correlations between, I think, the experience of non-whites, no matter what part of the world they identify with. Um, I just thought it was fabulous. But I know that you have a great background in media. I would consider you an expert. And uh, I was wondering what your opinion is about Univision and why do they take that sort of, uh, I would, without having a better word, the whiter kind of appearance for what Hispanics represent the world. For, what you think about that? What, what Hispanics? Uh, they, well, the, I, the, I, Univision and I think a general opinion. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Univision, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, this is a terrible thing, and uh, we, we should speak about it more openly. I am, uh, and I'm appalled, and maybe uh, you have been appalled too. You travel through South America, you see all the billboards, you see all the ads, 
and they're all whites, and they're all not, they're blondes and blue-eyed people. It's as if, you know, this is what we should all aspire to be. Um, and even though people have, you know, in, in whole the towns and villages where people have never seen a blonde person or a blue-eyed person, but that is the, that's the television uh, model and the advertising model. You see people playing, this is really uh, uh, upsetting to me, you see people playing um, uh, indigenous roles in uh, telenovelas in Latin America, and they're blonde and blue-eyed with, you know, dark makeup on. Um, it's, it's ridiculous, uh, and it is something that I think that uh, culturally we're slowly getting over, uh, we're beginning to get over it in, in Peru. Uh, only recently, though, I mean, only in the last 15 years or so, people are realizing there is this huge rising middle class you know, people have been pulled out of poverty in so many Latin American nations in the past 15 years or so, that now you look around and you say the people who are buying things, who are in the malls, who are the, uh, the sort of commercial base for, for any kind of success that you would have, um, are you know, the, the, the people who look like Latin Americans, who, people who are not blonde and blue-eyed. Um, but that continues to be a kind of um, uh, model, unfortunately. We're getting over it. Yes, Georgia. But on the other hand, the magazines in uh, Mexico, Argentina, anywhere, they're all blue eyed blondes, thin, thin, thin. Yes. And that's kind of a universal example. Even I suppose so. Most of that, whatever it is, the models are, are size water, size two. Yes. So it's a very unfortunate thing. And I was talking once to Plaza Domingo, and he was saying how unfortunate it is that Univision is such a low intellectual level. Yes. And it's really, really sad. I mean, they're really dumbing everything down rather than, of course, television in general, but I think just Univision in particular. Yes. Has a very, very low intellectual level. Absolutely. And I was just, I, somebody was telling me the other day that uh, Variety, you know, comes out every once in a while with the top the ratings. And the top ratings of the top 10 ratings of uh, shows in the United States of America were actually three Spanish telenovelas. And you can imagine, you know, the, 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 uh, the level. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, but that's what we've got. But then the term Latino is, is not really accepted by everybody in the community. No, that's right. And um, it's almost like a subculture and uh, very dangerous because the whole like Amerique Latin was invented by Napoleon. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was Spanish America, Portuguese America. Mm -hmm. So Napoleon, when he came to Louisiana and all that, he envisioned this great empire, and it was, you know, Amerique Latin. And Latinos includes Italian, French, Portuguese. That's right. And That's right. So well, it's it, all. It, I think it's gonna pass. Chicano pass. Yeah. You know, for, for the longest time, it was Hispanic areas, the Spanish borderland. I mean, mm -hmm. historians consider half of the United States and the southern western part was Hispanic borderland. Then it became Hispanic Americans, Hispanos, Hispanics. So it perhaps has more staying power than uh, Latino. Chicano is frankly disappearing. Yeah. And Latino is very much certain segment, the Hispanic caucus, <coughs> Hispanic caucus. Yeah. I think that you know, we've all suffered from the mislabeling. I remember my, my grandfather, a wonderful man, um, used to say, you know, what is it with the Americans up there saying that they're, the, they're Americans? We're Americans, you know, and, he, and if he were living today, he probably would say this was the greatest uh, incidence of, of identity theft, you know. <laughs> we're, we're, we're all Americans, and I, I always try to make a point of saying North Americans and South Americans and Central Americans, but, uh, you know, there are, there are uh, there are a whole lot of Americans in, in, uh, who, who resent the fact uh, that the label has been taken away from us. So, I mean, there is a lot of mislabeling that has gone on I, I don't know what's in, going the, in the, the process. Future, but right now, yeah. I think I use Hispanic slash Latinos. Yeah. Because I know that so many look like Latinos. Yeah. But Hispanic is less, more accepted. So, so it seems to be. Seems to be. Even North American is, is uh, mislabeled because Mexico is fully North American. Of course, of course. And so North Americano is Mexicano. Is Mexicanos and Canadians as well. So, That's right. So I say United States. I don't yeah. say Americano. I say Estados Unidos. Right. United right. States. So 
Right. We'll we'll get there someday, I suppose. Yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. La raza cósmica. La raza cósmica. Yeah. Right. How does that theology received by the world. That? Well, you know, when he wrote it, uh, it is so funny because the 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 the, the book that he wrote that. Vasconcelos wrote La Raza Cosmica, which a lot of people actually have bought as, uh, you know, mistakenly thinking it's a science fiction book. Uh, but it is, <laughs> it, it is really, in, in fact, um, a, a statement of his philosophy, which was uh, that, you, you know, not only are we a mixed race uh, people, but envisioning a kind of future in which everybody would be mixed race. Um, so, it, it, you know, it was, it, it was really very much, uh, uh, I don't think Vasconcelos was really listened to beyond Mexico and perhaps a few other intellectuals in, in, in South America, but it was not, um, it was not uh, I think, taken seriously, particularly since he ran into his own controversies with his own allegiances to, to um, there was a kind of, um, uh, Germanophilia in Latin America just because they saw the uh, Hitler's Germany as being a, a powerful force against North American sort of hegemony. So um, uh, he ran into a problem there. But the basic thought, which was, you know, we are a mixed race people, is something that has come back as something to, as, as, as an issue to discuss, which, you know, he was very right about that. We are a mestizo people. Yes, Nina. When um, Pope Francis got the um, uh, I noticed that in the media when they would say that he was the first American, the, the reporters would hesitate a little bit because they had to think about the fact that he was American. And having used Pope Francis as, a, as part of my question, could you tell us a little bit about The what event, I'm sorry? The, the December event right. in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And the Virgen de Guadalupe is there. Yes, about? yes. Well, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the election of the Pope is really, really very interesting. Um, very interesting to me because, in fact, uh, Catholicism has dropped down to the, the uh, southern hemisphere. And this is where Catholicism now is. It's actually. Uh, struggling in, uh, in, in Europe that is no longer the strongly Catholic uh, Europe that it used to be. Um, it's losing ground actually in Brazil, which is the first place that the Pope, the Pope visited was Brazil. It was losing major ground in Brazil. Two out of five people call themselves evangelists in Brazil now. Uh, and uh, so the, the, it has, there's been a, a shift that the Vatican has been very aware of. Um, the um, uh, the Pope, the American Pope, is really, uh, uh, I feel, uh, a very uh, crafty and smart uh, decision to try to pull back uh, a little bit of that loss, the the sliding losses in Latin America. Uh, evangelism is is every day uh, larger and larger. I can see it in Peru myself. You know, and, and, and uh, interesting because the, um, uh, I wrote about this for the New York Times, there, uh, uh, somebody I knew in Brazil who said, you know, the people come to the door and they say, I'm an evangelist, hire me, because I won't drink, I won't, uh, uh, you know, uh, steal, uh, and I'll be here in the morning at 8, 8.30 in the morning, and you know Catholics drink, steal, and they won't be here in the morning, so hire me. <laughs> You know, and this is exactly what's what's why there's been a uh, so um, little by little. You know, there has been such a uh, actually uh, fury over the the election of the Pope in, in America, so that it, even the people who are not Catholics are so pleased with the fact that uh, that an uh, a, an American has been uh, has been given the role. The um, uh, the whether or not it will staunch the flow of people away from the church, we'll see. The, the biggest growth in the Catholic Church now is in Africa. 
and in Asia, believe it or not. Uh, very much a southern hemisphere. Did I answer your question, or was, was there something else? No, no, you, you did partially, but then I wanted to know about your December event and the big thing that was up there. I heard something connected to those two. Oh, you mean the December event that we're having at the library? Oh, oh, absolutely. Um, well, you know, the, the, we're having it on the day of the, the Virgen de Guadalupe, uh, Dia de, de la Virgen. Uh, and, and as Barbara Tenenbaum, our, our Mexico specialist, can tell you, um, the Virgin of Guadalupe is not only a, is, 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 is a religious uh, symbol, of course, but it has grown to be much more than that. Uh, uh, she is a, a national symbol. She is the, uh, it was her face that was carried into battle during the revolution. Um, so we are, we are having the December event, starting it on the Day of the Virgin, really because it is the symbol of Mexico, and having it for two days, we're greatly looking forward to it. It, um, it should be uh, the whole point of it, uh, th thank you because it does connect to what I'm saying here, is the diversity of Mexico. You know, people have a notion, and it's a Hollywood notion of who Mexicans are, uh, and it's the notion that's been given to us, I think, in, in, in by the media. But uh, Mexico is an enormously diverse, rich uh, country of many, many cultures and many, many languages, and we're going to try to sort of push that envelope a little bit. Um, with this conference of two days and, and, and show a Mexico that maybe people haven't really thought about. And the library has so many wonderful treasures, uh, not only of throughout Latin America, but uh, specifically Mexican treasures that we're going to try to bring out with um, Barbara and Georgette's uh, and other people at the library's help to show a little bit of that extraordinary kind of um, uh, uh, diversity, as I say, that the human diversity, biodiversity, that we just don't think about when we think of Mexico. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes, Catalina. Uh, Marie, would you, would you say that U.S. culture has had an impact in that cultural mentality in Latin America of being a little bit ashamed of the darker skin and wanting to look white and wanting to be proud? Yes. Absolutely yes, and it's been something that, that you know that has been that has been uh, I think driven into the Latin Americans for so long and Hispanic Americans for so long, uh, and that that sometimes we ourselves don't recognize it. Uh, it was it was started. I mean, when you think of history, you go back. There's always an explanation in history. In the Spanish colonies, uh, uh, there was such. A, an a, attempt to subjugate the people, that you could not move, there are many, many things, you could not move from one colony to another, uh, you could not read, printing presses were not allowed, you could not go down and uh, make your own mine shaft if you were living over a copper vein, you couldn't build your own, you couldn't raise your own, or grow your own plum trees because all of this was to be controlled by the church, or I'm sorry, by the church, by um, something, somehow, a little bit by the church, uh, but by Spain. Um, and, and Spain kept its colonies in very rigorous sort of uh, attention to itself, like spokes of a wheel rather than, you know, one large colony out there. Uh, the colony, the vice uh, roys were all uh, reporting directly to the court of Spain. And in the process, and I have seen this myself, if you go down, and as I have done uh, looking up my ancestors in Ayacucho or Cusco, uh, you go into the churches and you lo start looking through the, the um, records and you see, you know, uh, 1600s, 1700s, you see uh, so-and-so was born, Indio, levy attacks, and that's exactly what was done. Uh, you know, so-and-so was born, Blanco, no tax. Uh, so and so was born. Mezclo de sambo, which is what they called the blacks, sambo y indio, half tax. Um, uh, you know, it was an extraordinary uh, system to tax the people according to the color of their skin. Um, and this was uh, driven for so many years into the, you, know, the, the you, were, you were judged by the color of your skin. Uh, there's no question about it. When 
Spain uh, was driven from Latin American shores. The white Creoles essentially took the same structure and put themselves in the place of Spain. So you had, uh, whereas, you know, the Bolivar uh, and uh, so many who fought for that revolution thought that they were going to be achieving what Vasconcelos said in that quote that I, uh, I mentioned, uh, equality, because that's what they were promising. This was what was being promised, equality between all the races. Uh, what, was what was actually, what happened when Spain evacuated was the white Creoles put themselves at the top and the hierarchy remained. And the whole business of, uh, it, it actually was, was um, vicious kind of racism that set in. And for many, many years it has been that way. And um, uh, the skin, the, the, the way that Spain actually recorded the color of skin it's very much on people's minds, even to this day. And the, and the whole notion uh, that Spain had that you must keep everybody, um, you know, as little enlightened as possible because they'll be more pliant that way. You find it today in, in, the, in, in Lima, you see if somebody puts out on their door, they say, I'm looking for a maid, no education necessary. And that's the idea, because then that way they will be more pliant to you. There's, a, you know, there's still a lot of that, uh, and it's going to take a long time to get over uh, 300 years of that kind of behavior, and then 200 years more of a kind of Creole um, uh, sort of uh, governance. So, but uh, I, uh, there's there's evidence that you know slowly things are changing. Yes, Leah. Thank you for that question. Bolivar has um, an, an amazing um, legacy in the sense that uh, every creed claims him. I mean, the people on the left, Pinochet loved Bolivar and Hugo Chavez loved Bolivar. So, I mean, there you have, you know, it, it tells, tells you a, a tale. Um, there is, uh, th there are, it's really interesting when you go back, there's a wonderful book called El Rostro de Bolívar, which is the face of Bolívar as it was recorded by, you know, over time in portraits, because photography was not uh, had at the time, so it was all by portraits. And it's so interesting to see that uh, depending on where he was uh, in, you know, his expedition, in their expeditionary force to, um, to liberate the countries, depending on where he was, he looks like a different race. And uh, there, uh, in, in certain portions of, of, um, of Venezuela, where he actually was painted as, as, almost, as, as a very African face, and uh, in certain places in, in Bolivia, Ecuador, where he was, he has a, a very indigenous face, a very Indian face. Um, and, you know, there was this, what one of his generals called the magic of his prestige. You know, everybody wanted to be Bolivar. Everybody wanted a piece of him. Uh, f uh, when he died, as I said, he died at the age of 47 of, of tuberculosis, completely poor. He had born a very rich man. He died absolutely penniless. Um, but uh, within uh, 10 or 12 years, his uh, fame, of course, came surging back. And he's probably the most monumentalized uh, Latin American figure uh, in all of history. I mean, you don't see um, marble dedicated to, to uh, so many people as you do as to Bolivar. Um, but he is, uh, as I say, the magic of his prestige. He is loved by many, many sides and also hated by many, many sides as well. My father hated Bolivar, which is something I needed to get over. Um, he thought San Martin was much, much better and wished that I was writing a book about him. So, Yes, last question. 
Do you have any thoughts about Dora Heyerdahl's idea that Polynesian was settled by South Americans rather than Asians? There's a, there's a lot of debate about that, of course. And you know, you see you see the the archaeological digs in in Lambayeque in Peru, for instance, the uh, the Lords of Sipan. And you see uh, uh, people who are actually positing that, they, that uh, the, those reed ships that we have in the Lake Titicaca um, were, you know, they're, these are they're all of Asian influence or Middle Eastern influence. And there is a theory that there was a, a Chinese people who came down the coast of, of Latin America. There's also a theory that uh, there, were, there were Middle Easterners, uh, let's say Egyptians, who were actually uh, in, made it all the way to Lake Titicaca because when you look at the, the artifacts, they would tend to argue. You look at uh, the uh, lacquer uh, arts in, in, on the coast of Peru, you look on, as I say, the reed ships in, in Lake Titicaca. There's a, you know, a lot of debate about it. I don't know that uh, much has been proven, but it's a very interesting, very interesting uh, discussion. Thank you so much to everybody for coming. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.